We'd like to thank Montecito Bank and Trust for their generous support in making Scam Squad possible. I'm Patty Teal. And I'm Deputy District Attorney Vicki Johnson. Scam Squad is up next. Sound off. One, two. Sound off. Three, four. One, two, three, four. Scam Squad. Welcome to Scam Squad. I'm your host, Patty Teal, here as always with Deputy District Attorney Vicki Johnson. And she has a colleague with her who always has some great things to share as well. Vicki, I'll let you do the honors. Okay, thank you, Patty. Yes, I'm so happy to have back with us today Dayton Aldridge, my colleague at the District Attorney's Office and our restitution specialist. Now, Dayton's job is to ensure that all of our crime victims who are entitled to restitution from the state fund will get the financial help that they need. But he's always on the lookout too for scams. And he sent me an email about a skimmer at a local bank and I wanted him to talk a little bit about that. So welcome back Dayton, so Thank good you. to have you back. Welcome. Yeah, and first, would you just please tell us a little bit about the Victims Restitution Fund and what kinds of money is available to crime victims? Yes, so specifically California has what's called the California Victim Compensation Board. And that is essentially a pool of money that is available to victims who have been the victim of violent or sexual crimes. It, it doesn't cover people who are victims of purely property crime, like vandalisms and stuff like that. But any violent crime or any instance of abuse, um, there's a pool of money available um, to pay things like medical bills and mental health treatment and lost wages and medication and ongoing costs. And that's something that California fronts the payment of and then on the back end tries to go after the, the defendant after we get a conviction and, and make them responsible for it. But unfortunately, a lot of the defendants don't have assets and don't, they're indigent. So there's never going to be any restitution money coming from them. So in these instances, at least there's some money for victims of violent crime in California. And that's something that I help um, the victims navigate and see if there's any funds available for them, or if they are a victim of a property crime, like their mailbox was vandalized, and I help them secure that restitution as well. Well, that must so, be very gratifying for you, Dayton, personally. It is gratifying. Um, for instance, we just recently were able to call someone who was a victim of a scam about 10 years ago of a Craigslist scam where they, they bought a truck sight unseen for $15,000 and there never was a truck and they thought the money was gone. And about 10 years later, they, they got a check in the mail for $15,000 that they were not expecting. So it can be very gratifying. Wow. Yeah, never give up hope, yeah. huh? So the news release that Dayton sent me was in Ed Hat. And here's what it said. Police are investigating a skimmer that was found at one of the ATM machines at Bank of America on Coast Village Road. So first of all, Dave, please tell us what a skimmer is and why you wanted to share this report with us. Yes, yeah, so a skimmer is a device that the thieves will implant into any device that you would stick a credit card into. So whether that's a gas pump at a gas station, an ATM outside of a bank, or um, maybe even a vending machine that accepts a card. Any card terminal, that's where the scammers will put a skimmer. And all it really is, is either just a little, almost like a sleeve that they will stick into where credit card goes mm -hmm. so that when the customer puts their credit card in, it's actually going into their little sleeve where they're recording all the information. Or they will also just put a little tiny camera because cameras now have gotten to the point where you can literally put a camera on the end of a pencil tip or on the end of a pin. That's how small cameras are. So they can put a camera looking right down where you put the credit card in and they can just take a picture of the numbers as they go in and out. They also can put these little cameras right above where you would enter your pin code or where you would enter your zip code if you're paying with the credit card. So they have your card number itself and then they have your pin code or your zip code. Um, so it's very, um, it's happening a lot right now and people are very vulnerable. Um, oftentimes people won't know that they've become a victim of this until weeks or maybe even a month or so later. And that's because 
there's two different versions of these skimmers. There's the really advanced ones where they have a little cell phone chip in it and every credit card that goes in and out, a copy gets sent to the scammer at his house on his couch or the slightly old school ones where the scammer will actually have to go back to the exact machine and retrieve the skimmer and then go back home and download it. So that could mean that the skimmer is in place for a month. You use your credit card on the first of the month the bad guy doesn't get the scammer until the 30th and you might not see any fraud happening in your account for a couple of weeks after that, way after whatever gas wow. station is way in the back of your memory. Right. So how do the scammers put skimmers? That's a kind of a tongue twister. How do scammers put skimmers in place? They usually, yes. Yeah, so they usually do it at night in secret um, in low traffic areas. So imagine a gas station on a corner where the lights are dim and it's three o'clock in the morning and there's no traffic in or out. The scammer is gonna pull up into the gas station. They're gonna look like they're getting gas and they're gonna spend a few minutes at the terminal. But really what they're doing is they're putting this little skimmer device into the machine. And that's why our best practices for all of these skimmers we're talking about, whether it's a bank, a gas station, a vending machine, is to go into the store in person because it's much more difficult for the scammer to get that device onto the point of sale system when it's right under the clerk's nose. Because it takes a few minutes for them to install this device, much more difficult to do inside where the person's looking at you in the eyes. Much more simple and easy to do outside in the middle of the night. Of course. And is there any way to detect these skimmers just by looking at the machine? I would say not by looking at the machine, but perhaps by feeling the machine if, if there's any sort of a wiggle or any play into where you're putting the credit card, um, you should avoid that. Also for gas stations specifically, mm -hmm. you'll see they have a little security ribbon um, or tape that's where they actually have the computer terminal inside the pump. If that tape or that ribbon is compromised at all, then you shouldn't sure. be using that yeah. device. So, um... Is it better to use a credit card or a debit card, Dayton? Yeah, so that's one of our big protections is if people can transition towards using a credit card versus a debit card, we'll have a lot more protection. And that's because the credit card companies have a no fault, no liability for fraud for the card holder. So you get your American Express statement at the end of the month, you see chargers that are not yours, you call a company, they take care of it, they send you a new card, you move on with your life. Very different if you're using a debit card in that same scenario, you've used your card in the first of the month. They don't end up stealing it until six weeks after that, draining your account. And if you're a person that only checks your bank statement once a month when they send you the paper copy in the mail, you could be dealing with an account that's completely drained and then going to your bank and trying to explain and having them walk back that and put the funds back into your account is nearly impossible. It's, wow. it, you're, you have a lot more protection if you use a credit card. So Patty, I've also gotten some information that scammers are using fake QR codes to get access to information that's contained in our cell phones. And since this is another techie kind of area, I've asked Dayton to come in and talk to us a little bit about that. So first of all, Dayton, would you tell us what a QR code is? and what they're usually used for. Yes, yeah, so the QR codes are those little, maybe one and a half inch by one and a half inch squares that look like they have a little maze, a black and white maze inside that we've seen really spring up since COVID started when we were doing things from home and everything was takeout and everything was no touch. That's really when the QR codes became mainstream. A lot of times we'd see them at restaurants instead of holding a physical menu, you'd sit down at the table, there'd be a little QR code on the table saying, scan the QR code to see our menu, okay? So that's great. Um, and technology, it, it can really help us out. But really, people just need to understand that that QR code is just a visual representation of a URL link. But it's just so that you can hold up your phone and go to your camera app, your camera can see it, and then just go right to the web page. So, so why do scammers find these useful? What do scammers use by setting up fake QR codes? I mean, what are they trying to, to, to do? So they are trying to get you to scan their QR code and it will either take you to a website 
That website will download malware or spyware onto your phone, meaning they potentially have a mirror image of your device, you know, your contact, your banking information, your emails, everything. Um, it could also put advertisements and junk on your phone that's going to slow it down and, 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 and stuff like that. Um, just as if you were to get an email and you would see in the email that there was a mysterious link. We we talk all the time about not clicking mysterious links. You get a text message, don't click the mysterious link. You get an email from someone you don't know, don't click the link. The QR code, it's just a link. It's just okay. a link in a little square box that your, that your phone can easily understand and take you to the website. So meaning if you go to your favorite coffee shop every time and you trust them, you're probably fine if you scan their QR code to view their, their menu, right? But if you get a mysterious email from someone who you don't know mm -hmm. or a text message from someone who you don't know the QR code, yeah, don't open it, don't scan it because it could be malware, spyware. The other thing is, is that it could, all of doing is taking to a website, right? So someone could create a malicious website that has malware that they're sending you to. They also could maybe have that direct you to a pornographic website. And then they could put a bunch of QR codes all over an ice cream shop or a GameStop and enticing, well, there's gonna be a bunch of kids here. Just how we warn adults to stay away from opening links, we have to start educating our youth. Don't click on every link. Don't walk down the street and scan every QR code you see with your phone because you have no idea where it's taking you. Very, very interesting. I, I mean, it's amazing what these scammers are coming up with, Patty. I mean, this is something I would never have even guessed or understood. You're right. But Dayton likens it to not clicking on a link then it makes sense. Then I right. Can, I guess these uh, scammers can just make a sticker too and put it over the real QR code and absolutely. So that's a, that's another best practice. Maybe is if if you just take a second and take your finger and run your finger over the QR code before you whip your phone out, then you'll at least be able to see if it's printed in the material that you're accessing. Like if it's printed in the menu, you're probably fine. Versus if it's a sticker that someone mm -hmm. slapped over mm -hmm. something, right. you don't know. Just make sure you are confident in uh, the person who's sending you the QR code or the business that's using the QR code. It's just like you don't want to click on an unknown link. You don't want to click on an unknown QR code. So, so much, so Dayton, much Dayton. Dayton. Absolutely. And before you share the good news, Vicki, would you give the fraud hotline phone number? Of course. Area code 805-568-2442. And I'll say that once again, 805-568-2442. And I welcome your phone calls. So we have some good news today and, and some kind of interesting news. I got a phone call from one of our listeners in Florida. Now, she was a woman in her 70s who got involved with a romance scammer. And once the romance faded, the scammer asked him to help her transfer money, which she did. Now, she never used any of that money. She simply set up a separate account, received the money, put it into the account, and then sent it on uh, using the instructions of the, of the scammer. Well, she didn't understand that what she was doing was potentially criminal. But while listening to our show, she realized that she had been turned into a money mule and that what she was doing was in fact illegal. So fortunately, she quickly cut off any contact with this person, stopped sending money for him but, and closed the bank account. But she raised some very interesting uh, questions and one that I don't have an answer to. Would the IRS expect her to pay taxes on the money sh that she received, even though she never used any of it. So this is something that money mules, even the ones who are unwitting money mules, need to think about. If they are working with somebody, quote, helping somebody out to transfer money, are they going to be taxed on that money that comes through their account, even though they never used the money? I think the argument could probably be made they had access to it. I sent her to her, her accountant to answer that question because quite honestly, I don't know the answer. 
but I was thrilled with the fact that she listens to our show. She listens to it every week. And she was able to discover a scam that had been perpetrated on her and get out of the clutches of that scammer. So I thought that was very good news. Now, on the same subject, I have some other good news. A New Jersey man was sentenced to 14 years in prison for money laundering but he knew what he was doing. He'd been running a, a romance scam by setting up fake dating profiles on various dating websites using fictitious or, or stolen identities and posing as a military man stationed in Syria. And this was his story. He said that he was receiving gold bars at payment for whatever he was doing in Syria. And once the romance was established with his victim, the scammer asked for money to help him ship those gold bars to the United States. But once the, and he said, once the bars arrive in the United States, um, the victims would be paid. Well, of course that never happened. And he was uh, convicted of money laundering. He was uh, obviously put out of business and sent to jail, but he did something very foolish, which was one of the ways he got caught. He posted photos of himself on social media, showing himself with large amounts of cash, high-end oh cars, designer clothing, expensive jewelry. So he sort of gave away the game and uh, that helped him get convicted. Well, I'm glad he helped himself to get convicted. Yeah. I don't feel too sorry for him. You know, um, we hear so much about the sweetheart scams and the romance scams, and it's sometimes the very hardest scam to hear about, and it really hurts people's hearts, and they really are hurt for a long, long time. Some of our um, listeners on YouTube, we get some wonderful comments, but people have a hard time understanding how people fall for it. Yes. And I, I don't know what your idea is on that, Vicki, if people are just lonely, they not that they're mean comments, but they're just like, why would they believe this? And do you have some insight on that? Well, I, I think I do, Patty. And part of it is loneliness. People just looking for that connection. And sometimes mm -hmm. they're just looking really for a friend, maybe a mm -hmm. friend to play uh, media games with. Uh, sometimes they are looking for romance. But what you have to understand is that these scammers, these particular kinds of scammers are master psychologists. Right. And they really know how to build a relationship, how to groom the victim, mm -hmm. how to make the victim believe, first of all, that they're a best friend, and then they're a soulmate, and then they're a romantic partner. And scammers talk about getting their victims what they call under the ether, mm -hmm. getting them so they are not uh, operating with their rational brain. They're operating strictly out of emotion and they keep them so occupied. They, they, what we call love bomb them, mm -hmm. constantly sending them messages, sometimes sending them small little gifts, but keeping them very occupied and keeping them sort of isolated from friends and family members who might be able to say, Hey, wait a minute, something's fishy about this. This doesn't seem real, but they hook these people in. Uh, emotionally to the right. point where they just have a terrible time extracting themselves and they will believe almost anything the scam. Wow. So very similar to any kind of an abuser where they shut you off from other people that you know would warn you or care about you and they isolate you. So it is a very professional um, horrible con that they do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know it is hard to believe. Mm -hmm. But I talked to uh, quite a few of these victims and I can see how it happens. I right. Can see how it happens. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. Of course. So we have our good news and we have skimmers to watch out for and QR codes to be careful about. Thank you. This was really a great show. And I look forward to what you have to share with us next week. And Dayton, don't be a stranger. We look forward to having you back. Thank Thanks, you. Patty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.